looking at the book of Ruth, doing a series in the book of Ruth, and so if you've got your Bibles, there's a great few verses there that I want to take from chapter 1. I, I, I don't like taking too long in series, but I sort of get into it, and there's just such some good stuff here that I thought, no, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to miss what God wants to say most of all but there's, some, there's some, a great thought here in chapter 1 and I didn't take it last week but just for those who haven't been with us in catching up look this series is uh, I'm calling it destiny series because that's what God was wanting to do here in, in, in Ruth's life and certainly in the life of Israel and uh, even coming right through and we'll, we'll talk about the connection with David and the whole messianic line. But there was a destiny on her life. This, this, little, this little girl from an outback town on the wrong side of the, the rail track. It's amazing how God used her and God can use ordinary people, amen? God wants to use ordinary people to change the world. I'm just an ordinary man with a super, super fantastic God. We're just ordinary people with a wonderful God. And, you know, when you, when you look at life in, in that framework, he gets the glory. And so God took the weak things of the world to confound the wise. He took the ordinary. Sometimes in our ordinariness, we... We, we, we think, oh, well, I'm, I'm not good enough and, and uh, you know, I, I wasn't born on the right side of the street. But I want to tell you, God can take each and every person here and, and make you a world beater. You'll be amazed. You'll be amazed what's in this room right now. Stephen. God can take your life. He can take my life he can take us as a church and do something significant in our world and that's what God wants and and at the end of the day it's for his glory and so our first message was on change the, there was a a um, famine in the land and they felt to move out and change and so in destiny there's always change this is a breakthrough year so there will be change everybody say I like change Everybody say, I hate change. <laughs> it's one of those things. It's one of those animals. You, you like it and you hate it, but it's got to happen. You've got to see change in our lives, and God is wanting to change us. Last week we spoke about challenge and how Naomi was severely challenged. She lost her husband. She lost her two sons. And she went away full. She came home empty. And we, we, we talked about how we go through life and what we do when those challenges come. I tried to bring out last week, you know, that the smile of God is really on us. And the fact that the Christ has taken the anger of God from, from us as we believe in Christ, that the wrath of God came up upon Jesus at the cross. And uh, that, that anger, that wrath that is stored up you know, for, for anybody outside of Christ and Judgment Day is coming. But I just believe we need to go through life with the smile of God. In, in hindsight, I was just talking to uh, some of the pastors here, and, and to say that God is never angry with us is, is not fully correct theologically. And, you know, even parents, there, there's a righteous anger that God does have. And, and so at times... We, we might sense that and know that and so to say that God never gets angry with believers is probably not the right thing to say but I was trying to bring out the fact last week that God's smile is upon us in Christ and, and we don't need to be getting around each week thinking well is God picking on me if, if God is uh, you know, angry with you or if, he, if he's wanting to discipline you you'll know about it because that's the instruction side of it that God wants to give and so I just mentioned that in passing in regards to last week. But today I want to uh, speak about commitment. We've talked about ch change, challenge. Today we're going to speak about commitment. And our, our reading is from Ruth chapter 1, 
15 to 18. Look, Naomi said to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. You should do the same. But Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. And wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. And may the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. And when Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. These are powerful, powerful verses in the Bible, and certainly as... Ruth was saying this to Naomi. She was making the decision of her life. These verses have actually been used at weddings uh, to speak about the commitment that someone gives to another person. And certainly this commitment is the kind of commitment that we give in marriage. Till death us do. In other words, wherever you go, I'll go. Wherever you live, I'll live. And I'm with you till death do us part. Here, she said, and your God will be my God. And so she was, she was putting it out there and she's giving a declaration and making a decision here in regards to her commitment. You know, commitment's a message that our society, I believe, needs to understand afresh. We, we have lost a lot of our commitment to one another in genuine love towards our fellow human beings and sadly today the law you know has to continue to change to to help bring our society from from hurting each other you know when love goes out the window law has to replace it and so they've got to keep making more laws and more laws and more laws but the greatest law that that God gave is, is we should love one another. And I want to speak to you today about, you know, loving God and loving people. But we need to be committed to one another. A young man sat down and he began to text his, his girlfriend in devotion and commitment. He texted her and he said, Darling, he said, I would swim the widest ocean for you. I would climb the highest mountain. I would cross the hottest desert for you. I'd die at the stake for you. And I'll see you on Saturday if it's not raining. <laughs> you know, our commitment says a lot about us. It says about who we are. It says about what we're going to do. It speaks about our destiny. Naomi didn't seem to be able to offer these girls anything. Ruth and uh, in the story there in chapter 1, the other daughter-in-law, Orpah, she told them to go home. Orpah didn't love Naomi enough to follow her. Orpah means double-minded. That's what the name means, double-minded. And so... She, she hadn't got that commitment for God or for Naomi to follow her. And so she is seen in the scriptures here as someone who turns away from God, someone who knows God but will not follow God. You know, there's a lot of people in our nation, they love the values of God, but they don't want to follow Jesus. And so Orpah is, is that kind of person and she re represents either a backslidden person or a person that will not follow God and, and give this kind of commitment. But Ruth, on the other hand, is giving that commitment. And she chose Naomi to follow her against all the odds. She was a Moabite, and yet she had to go to Bethlehem. And so she had to, to move out of her place of origin. Her past was against her. She was a widow. Her religious tradition was against her. She was an idolater who worshipped false gods. Her own sister-in-law was against her. She was alone in this decision. Her future was against her because she was going to a nation or a place where there was little room for Gentiles. Ruth, however, at this point in her life was, was we might say she was still young and free. 
She could do anything she wanted to. She could choose to go back. She could choose to follow Naomi. She had freedom of choice. And I, and I like the picture that this represents here because, you know, God has given us all a freedom of choice. You don't have to follow God if you don't want to. However, you do have to uh, ultimately have the consequences of that. And that, sadly, is hell. And, and it's a life apart from God. You know, anything outside of God is hell. If you want to describe hell, it's life without God. Heaven is life with God. And when you come to understand who God is, we understand what heaven is. And so uh, Ruth, in her decision, chose her destiny. And uh, she made the right choice. She made that choice with no strings attached. And she said to Naomi, I'm with you. Wherever you go, I'm going. Your God will be my God. I'm living with your people. I'll follow your people. And uh, it'll be till death do us part. I'm going to love God. I'm going to love people. And I'm going to love where I live. When you drove in this morning, you might have noticed on the front of our board down there, loving God, loving people, loving life. Jesus was asked the question, what is the greatest commandment? And you know, the Jews didn't only have the Ten Commandments. Through their history, they actually, it got up to some, I think it's 613 different commandments that they had to know and live by. All these laws that they live by, 613. You know, they, they look back and they're, they're, they're all listed. And so here's Jesus being asked the question, oh, what, what's, the, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus responded in this way, in Matthew 22, 37, it should be on the overhead, and he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And this is the great and first commandment. And a second is like this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. I love Jesus because he makes life so simple. You know, to try and remember 613 commandments, you'd be getting up each morning and think, I hope I don't break one today. <laughs> and, 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 and all of them were, thou shalt not. You know, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Jesus comes over in the New Testament. When you get into love, he says, thou shalt. It just changes the whole way you look at life. It's a positive way that we look at life. And so Jesus is saying here, come on. Just love God, love people. So this morning I want to talk about how we love God and how we love people. When a person gets married, they promise to love one another and forsake all others and cling to their spouse. Christianity is, is very much the same. When we choose God, God is not just an add-on to our belief system or our world. He, he needs to become all in all. Jesus needs to become L-O-R-D. <laughs> Jesus needs to become Lord of our life. He, he can't just have another place on the shelf. And, and so it, with, with Ruth's commitment to Naomi, it, it was just an all out 100% commitment to her. And I think it describes what it really needs in our life. And when we come to God, we need to say, Jesus, you are Lord. And we need to make that as a choice, not just some emotional feeling that we have or out of some decision that, well, Jesus, if you can fix my life up, I, I'll follow you. My marriage is a mess. My business is a mess. My family's a mess. And look, if, if, if you can help me, I'm going to follow you. You know the problem with that? When your family comes right and your business comes right and everything else comes right, you say, goodbye, Jesus. I don't need you anymore. I'm okay now. You ever seen that happen? People come in, God blesses them. They have miracles in their lives. 
I'm fixed up now, I don't need you anymore. They never ever really made a decision of heart to say, Jesus, I choose you till death do us part. You know, I was brought up in church and um, at around about seven years of age, I was in a meeting like this and the preacher was preaching and as a young man or a young boy, I made my decision to follow Jesus. I, I felt, you know, the heartbeat of God saying, you need, you need Jesus in your heart. You're, you, you're a sinner and uh, you, you need God. And so I, I made my decision there as a young man at seven or eight. But you know, it wasn't really till I was around about 17 years of age that I made that deeper choice to say, Jesus, this is it till death do us part. It's often when you get your license and you get your freedom that you make some big choices in life. And so I just got my license and I started skipping church. My father was the pastor and so to skip church was a big thing because I, you know, I didn't feel like I was honouring my dad and started skipping some meetings and I was down the main street of Tamworth. where We lived in Tamworth and people would do Peelies. Peel Street was the main street and you know, blokes would drive their cars up and down and we'd have loud mufflers on wide wheels and all those kind of things that we used to do. And I, I, sat, I remember sitting down the, the main street there just pondering what I was going to do with my life. And I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me. And it was just like a voice came into you know, my heart saying, you know, the world is very much like a fire crackers. It's, it, it's like fireworks. It's all fun and, and exciting at the time. But you end up with a burnt out shell. And you know, there's great pleasure in the world. Anybody that says there's no pleasure in the world has never really lived. There is pleasure in the world. But the problem is, what, it, what do you have at the end of that pleasure? And, and it very much is, is, is smoke and a burnt out shell without God. And I thought that was a great description. And, and as I was sitting there, I made my choice. I thought, I don't want that. I, I want a life of purpose. I want, I want a life with God. And from that moment on, I really began to follow Jesus with all my heart. And you know, for each and every one of us today, I, I don't know everyone here this morning, but somewhere along the line, you are going to have to make a choice with God. And that choice won't be about your circumstances. That choice will be about your heart. We love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. It's about you. God wants you. That's why you're here. God wanted a you. You're the only you in the planet. You're the only you that will ever be born. You're the only you with your DNA. You're the only you that looks like you and sounds like you, with fingerprints like you. You're the only you in existence. And God wanted a you. He wanted you. My question this morning is, do you want him? He wants you. He gave his only son for you. Do you want him? That's your choice. And he gives you the freedom of that. He won't force that upon you. Well, how do, how, do, how do I know, Pastor, that God loves me? Well, just look at the cross. You can't help but see God and God's love for us making a way to, to salvation and to God through Jesus Christ. There is no other way to the Father, Jesus said, but by me. And so... We, we speak a love for God. We speak a relationship with God. And that comes out of knowing him. The Greeks had three words for love. Because love, you know, has got so mixed up today. And, and love is, you know, oh, that feeling. When I first laid eyes on Rhonda, I got that, oh, feeling. 
I was about 17. She was about 15. She had those big boots on. Remember girls used to wear the big boots? And she had a mini skirt. <laughs> oh, what a feeling. <laughs> and it wasn't Toyota. <laughs> it was Rhonda. But it wasn't love. Well, it was love. The Greeks had three words for love. Eros, phileo and agape. And it really helps you understand what love is. Eros speaks about the sensual kind of love. Ooh! That, oh, what a feeling kind of love. And, uh, you know, you, you, you don't get married, you don't make commitments on that, that sensual kind of relationship. A lot of people today try and do life, and they try and have partnerships. They try and have a marriage that is, that is built just purely on, on some sort of sensual kind of love. It's got to be far, far deeper than that. And the second one is phileo. Phileo speaks of friendship. I'm your best friend. And so that should be in a relationship. But this, this love is based on, if you'll be my friend, I'll be your friend. While ever you're scratching my back, I'll scratch yours. While ever we're buddies, we'll travel together. And so it was based on a reciprocal kind of relationship. If you're looking after me, I'll look after you. As long as it all goes well, we'll stay friends. But hey, you do the wrong thing by me, buddy, or... You know, you cross me, that's it. You know, you're, you're written out of my book. It's a friendship kind of relationship. Then you go far deeper and you come to the kind of love that we need for God and one another, and it's called agape. And agape looks at somebody else and they say to themselves, I choose to love you for who you are. And no matter what you do, I'm going to keep on loving you. If you hurt me, I'll keep loving you. Even if you're not a good boy all the time, I'll keep loving you. I choose to love you for who you are. Everybody say agape. For God so agaped the world, he gave his only begotten son. This is the kind of Love, it's God's love. You, you can't agape people unless you've got God on the inside. You can't do it. It's, it's, it's not a natural kind of love. We can't produce that kind of love. We can't love people. We can only love people with eros and phileo, but we can't love people agape unless we have the love of God in our own hearts. And so... This, this agape love is there and, and where you, you really get down and you choose and you make a decision based on choice. And so we choose to love God and that's the kind of love that we need to take us through. Thank you, Lord, for your love that gets a hold of us. Feelings come and go, but love as a choice stays with us. I read a little quote the other day and it says, the power of a resolution silences temptation. I like the thought. The power of a resolution, in other words, when you are resolute about something and you make the choice, you silence all the temptations. You haven't got all these things in your ear all the time because you've made a choice. You're not double-minded in it. I've made my choice. She's it. He's it. And so you journey on in life. That's the kind of love that we need. And Ruth had that kind of love. She left her citizenship. She left her family. She left her gods and uh, followed Naomi's God. Moving along. Secondly, this morning, we need a commitment to one another. She said, wherever you go, I, I will go. Your people will be my people. And so Jesus says here, you will love your neighbour as yourself. It's one thing to love God, it's another thing to love your neighbour. 
It's one thing to love Jesus, and it's another thing to love his church. But you can't have one without the other. You know, some people say, I love Jesus, but I don't like his wife. Oh, we're the bride. We're the bride. The Bible isn't male sexist. It calls men the bride. We're part of the bride, boys. And so in, in this journey with God, there needs to be a love for God and a love for people. I find it easy to love God, but I don't find it quite as easy to always love people. It's a bit like a zoo, isn't it? You know, there are many characters in the zoo. Some people have just such, such big feet like elephants, you know, they just tread on your toes. Some people are like giraffes, you know, they come at you and they look down their big long nose at you. And There's all kinds of people in the zoo. Welcome to the zoo! And so, in this collectiveness of life and the church of Jesus Christ, we find that God really tests our love and we can express our love, uh, the kind of love that we need to have one for another. And so, Naomi not only, uh, Ruth not only chose Naomi's God, she said, you're going to be uh, one that I love as well. The, the, the word Ruth actually means friend and companion. Isn't it beautiful just how the names? Any Ruths here? We got any Ruths? Well, the, the word Ruth is, is, is companion, friend. I'm sticking with you. I'm sticking with you. And, and we're going to do this together. And that's what the church is all about. That's what life's all about. You know, one day we all get a bit older and uh, one day, in the far distant future, you're going to be laying on your deathbed. And on your deathbed, you aren't going to say, now would you please go home and get me all the awards that I've won, all my, bring all my trophies into the hospital room here, I want you to bring all my degrees and all the awards I've won and, and that gold watch that I was given, would you please bring that in as well because I want to have all these things around me as I'm parting this life. Have you ever heard anybody do that? What we want in life is others around us. We want people. We lay there and, you know, in our pain or in our destiny, I hope, I hope Uncle Sam will come. I hope my son will come and visit me. I hope my friends will be around me. Because life is all about God and people. That's what Jesus was saying here. He was saying, love God and love your neighbour. Our slogan is formed in that way because if you love God and you love people, you'll love life. That's how it works. If you're after success in life, start loving God, loving people, and I want to tell you, you will love life. People who have found God and know God and begin to love people enjoy the best kind of life on the planet. There is no better life in this world than to love God and love people. If you want a happy, content, enjoyable journey, start loving God and serving people because that's where the life is. That's where the joy is. That's where the power is. That's where fulfillment is, it is, is loving people. And so God brings us to a place of loving him. In, in 1 John, there's quite challenging verses there. In fact, it says in 1 John 14, 16, uh, Jared there, it says, If we love our brothers and sisters 
who are believers, it proves that we have passed from death to life. But a person who has no love is still dead. Anyone who hates another brother or sister is really a murderer of heart. And, and you know that murderers don't have eternal life within them. So the test of our faith is, is how well we love one another and how well we journey with one another. So I'd like to challenge you today to say it's one thing to love God, it's another thing to love people, but that's where the life is. And so when we are challenged in life, when somebody has made us mad and upset us, that elephant of a person, we need to forgive and, and, and demonstrate the love of God towards them. And you know, this is challenging in church life. Who's never been hurt in church life? There's hundreds of hands going up in this room. <laughs> Who's never been hurt in their own family, natural family? Everybody, that's, that's family, this is life, this is the real world. And so... Some people come into church and they think they've got, they think we're in heaven. They think it's a perfect place. Well, it's, it's not a perfect place because you're here and I'm here. And we ain't perfect yet. We're close. <laughs> Aren't we, Lanise? We're close. <laughs> but we're not quite there yet. And we're going to say some things that we're going to regret. We're going to do some things we regret. But at the end of the day, if there's a choice, and if there's a agape love for one another, we're going to get through this in Jesus' name. And I, I just believe that we've got to have a, a greater commitment towards God and his church. You know, we, we just don't want to put up with the church. Oh, yeah, you know, I've been hurt and years ago, and they did this to me, and I gave all that money, and, you know, and they took it and abused it, and... Ra 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 ra, and all you know, we've all got a story. But I want to tell you and say, let let those hurts never cause us to lose our love for God and His church and people, because that's what the devil wants. The devil wants you to grow cold with your love towards other people, because if you grow cold, you won't do anything. You'll just come and sit on a Sunday and get bored. Oh, pastor, church is boring. No, it's not. You're boring. And you know why you're boring? Because you've lost your love. You get your love back and it'll all come alive again. And while ever God gives you breath, I believe that we all need to keep loving people and doing something that loves people because that's where the life is. That's where the hope is. And that's why we're here. Otherwise, we might as well go home. Why are we hanging around? Hello? It is 2015. We've been here long enough, I reckon, some days. Well, why are we still here? Why hasn't he come yet? Because we've got a job to do. We've got a mission to accomplish. You know, in, in this whole context of love, one for another, let's remember that we have a mission from God, and that's to love a, a lost world and, and see people one to Jesus Christ. You know, every day, every week, that ought to be on our minds and on our hearts. How can I share Jesus with somebody today? How can I share the love of God with somebody? Is, is there a moment that I can share Jesus with that person? And if we'll have that in our lives and that in our heart, if we'll have that in this church, I tell you, we're, we're going to do some great stuff for God. God's going to do some great stuff through us. If we can get through the stuff, if we can get over our hurts and through our pain and get back to loving God and loving people, I tell you, the journey will be sweet. You'll love the journey. You'll love the destiny. And my prayer is that if there's people here this morning that through, through hurts, and I tell you, some pastors do some stupid things. I'm one of them. Some pastors do some dumb things. 
A lot of amens here right now. <laughs> you know what I say? I, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for all those who've stuck through, at this church through some of the stuff that's happened over the years. And, and I say thank God for saints that, that say, God, I'm not giving up on you and I'm not giving up on your church. Because sometimes it's, e it's easier to walk away. For, for Orpa, it was just so easy. She just said, I'm going back home. That's it. She didn't have to put up with having to go to a new place. With, with all that went with her, to go to Bethlehem was major. But you know what? The day would come where Ruth would stand, and we'll talk about it in the weeks to come, where she would stand and she'd look back. And she, she looked back, oh, I'm glad, I'm so glad, I'm so glad I chose God and I chose to love people. Amen.